The ultimate issue in the universe is authority. Your eternal destiny and my eternal destiny is dependent upon declaring Jesus Christ as Lord. I was a witness to a conversation one time between two men that I loved. One was my age and one was much older. And the younger man, who at the time was probably 30 years old, was discussing with the older man, who was probably at the time 65 years old, the difference, what was the ultimate issue? The younger man was saying, the ultimate issue is love. That's the greatest commandment. And the older man just simply said, no, the ultimate issue is authority. And they never really gave any conclusive argument for their positions. And so I walked away from that conversation and was wondering, what is the ultimate issue? This was many years ago. And um, the Lord spoke to my heart. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in your neighbor as yourself. But a commandment presupposes authority is already in place. You can't give a commandment without authority. The ultimate issue in the universe is authority. The issue of authority is a why in the road where many Christians come up to it and they never grow beyond where they're at. And the reason they don't grow is they refuse to be submitted to authority. And they're good people. They're good people. There's lots of good Christians. I've met Christians who would do anything for anybody. They would love, they love to serve, they love to bless. They are good workers for the kingdom of God. But you can't tell them anything to do. They're not under authority. As long as they're the one deciding what they're doing, they're happy. As long as they're the ones deciding what to, how they're going to serve, they're happy. But if you tell them what you want them to do, there's inside of them rises up resistance right away because they've never met authority. And they have love, but they've never met authority. As a Christian, we should never grow stagnant. We're on a journey. We should never become static where we just don't grow anymore. And this issue of authority is going to be the issue that decides whether we grow or whether we stagnate. And if the world is ever going to see Jesus Christ manifested in his church, he's going to, they're going to see it because Christians have submitted to the Lordship of Christ and they have learned to submit to authority. And he will be able to flow through them without destroying them. Over the years, I have seen men destroyed by the anointing. They became casualties of the anointing because they had not learned authority. A friend of mine, who I've been privileged to know, he's an 88-year-old patriarch in the kingdom of God now. And about 35 years ago, longer than that, 40 years ago, he began seeing the issue of the lack of authority in the body of Christ and in the society. How many of you are aware that our society in the 60s broke loose from authority? They decided that the authority wasn't important anymore. And they decided the phrase, do your own thing, became the hallmark of the age. Well, that same cultural trend came into the church. Nobody wanted to submit to authority in the church. Well, this brother, he decided to 
look into it, and he began teaching on the need for authority. And he became well-known. I mean, internationally famous for his teaching on authority. Um, in one service that I have seen pictures of, he was preaching to 65,000 people in Kansas City, Missouri, in a, in a stadium. And on the front row, sitting next to his wife, was Billy Graham listening to him speak. When I'm not talking about some small-time preacher. I'm talking about a pretty successful man. And his teaching became well-known. But all of a sudden, the teaching on authority began to have major problems. He was the first person that I ever heard use this illustration. And he said, I was in a service where he was speaking, and he said, Whenever God in the church, in his, through his church, he's going to birth something. It's like the book of Revelation chapter 12, where the woman is pregnant with a man child. And before she even brings forth, he said, Satan is what Revelation 12 says. Satan is there waiting, the dragon, the serpent, Satan, to devour what the woman, the church, is ready to bring forth. And he felt like this issue of authority, the satanic kingdom was attacking it viciously, wanting to destroy it before it ever came forth. But you know, there's an old saying, if you can't beat them, what's the rest of it? Join them. We all know that saying. So what happened was he was teaching truth. I, I've heard him teach an authority and his teaching on authority was, at, I never heard him teach anything that I would say I would disagree with. However, what happened was, and we have people sitting here in this service this morning who were in churches where they were directly under this ministry and the authority became part of their ministry. But because those men in authority were not under authority and they were not loving the brethren with all their hearts, with the Lord, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and the neighbor as themselves, the people that were in authority became like little two-bit gods, little tin soldiers ruling over these churches. And all of a sudden, the pastors are having the men in the church wash their cars and the women clean their houses and carry their briefcases. And, 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 and it's, the excesses became incredible. And instead of being able to stop the teaching on authority from ever being taught... The enemy joined it and polluted it. But that doesn't change the reality that authority is the ultimate issue in the universe. Who's going to rule your life? I mentioned to you in the last number of weeks, I was talking to a man who was a businessman and used to have his company down the street here, and I've, I've known him since 1971. He's now retired, and he... I was talking to him one day, and he happened to be of a mainline denomination, a, you know, a, not an evangelical type, but it was a serious church. And he said to me one day, I said, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ was God, coming, born from a virgin. He said, I believe he died on the cross. I believe that he was raised again, and he founded the church. Well, I'm trying to get this guy saved. And I was a moment for a moment, I was taken back. I didn't know, I didn't know where to go. <laughs> I believe, I believe, I believe. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, the Bible says. And he's saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just quickened to me this thought, and I spoke it. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ your Lord? And he responded within a fraction of a second. I mean, it was instant. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. If Jesus Christ isn't your Lord, you're not saved. 
You can believe all you want that Jesus came and died and rose again and established the church and did all the miracles. You can believe everything the Bible says. But if he is not your Lord, you are not saved. Because if we don't confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is our Lord, we can't be saved. I was talking to another man who happened to be of that same denominational structure, and this happened just within the last couple months. He was sitting next to me in a restaurant. And um, I asked him, you know, do you believe? Yeah, I believe. And he went on the same route. I believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he was resurrected and raised up. And I thought, I'm going to ask him the same question. I said, this is an important question. I want you to answer it truthfully. He said, okay. Is Jesus your Lord? And he was sitting next to me. He goes, of course he's my Lord. That says, instantly. He instantly said he was his Lord. The other guy instantly said, I wouldn't go that far. The issue of salvation eternally depends on whether Jesus Christ is your Lord. And you've given up the rights to your life. You've surrendered the authority. Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And says, it didn't say it will set you free. It'll say it will make you free. Truth makes us free. But a lot of times truth makes us, makes us feel like we're in bondage. Because we're not allowed to do what we want. Is that true? How many of you have found the truth goes crossways sometimes with what you would like to do? Right? One of the most powerful statements I've ever heard a minister make is this. Freedom is not the liberty to do what I want, but the power to do what I ought. Let me say that again. Freedom is not the liberty to do what I want. It is the power to do what I ought. And let me say to you, absolutely beyond any doubt, it is a dangerous thing when we are diverted from the truth by what we want to believe. Turn with me to Romans, chapter 1. Paul, in chapter 1, verse 16, he begins talking about salvation For anyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God and is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then he says this amazing statement, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And he goes on down a little bit further, talking about how he gives them over to all these different issues of uncleanness where the women gave up their natural affection for men and women with men and women with women and men with men. Verse 27, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as, listen to this verse, this is the key verse. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Do you see the issue? He starts out saying they knew God and they would not glorify him as God. And then it says they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. They did not want to believe what was true because it was in variance with what they wanted to do. I've met so many people who are always looking for an excuse to do what they want to do by explaining God away, explaining the authority of the Scripture away. 
The enemy hates the Word of God because it's the final authority for all matters of faith and conduct. He hates it. And the reason he attacks Genesis chapter 1 and the book of Revelation more viciously than any other section of Scripture is Genesis chapter 1 shows us how Satan became Satan, chapter 1, 2, and 3, how Satan became Satan and where the world came from. And the end tells us where his end is. And in Genesis chapter 1, we, found out, we find out who made it all and who's in authority. And he starts the creation by making a man. And the first thing he does is he tells the man what he is to do. Do you ever notice that? He didn't say to Adam, now, Adam, I expect you to love me. He said to Adam, Adam, you're to replenish the earth. And you're to do this and that and the other thing. And he said, and you're not to eat that tree. He immediately was confronted with authority. As I said, you can't be diverted from the truth what you would, because of what you would like to believe. You can reject authority all you want if you choose to, but it'll be to your own destruction. You don't have to believe in authority. I've been around the mountain a few times. I was raised in the church from the time I was an infant. I was a committed Christian all through my grade school, high school years, and was called to the ministry at 15 and began pursuing the Lord for that purpose. And I have seen a lot of lives. You know what's interesting about people who will not come under authority? They demand that their families are under their authority, and they resist authority, but they're the only ones in authority over their own lives. They're the only ones who have the right to make, make any decisions. Your opinion is not to be your guide. The Bible says that Jesus made the statement, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. I personally have come to conclude that it is easy to tell if somebody is taking up the cross because they will be submitting to authority somehow in their life. Anybody who's not submitting to authority is deluded to think they're picking up the cross because to take up the cross means you deny yourself. You don't make all the decisions for yourself. You let God make the decisions, and you're denying yourself. When the Lord gives us directions and commands, whether we like them or not, His way is always the way to life, and the, any other way is a way to death. He will always lead you away from that which is deadly, and He will lead you always to that which is going to form His nature in you. The Lord is only out for your best interest. He's only out for my best interest. The Lord, God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And I love this phrase, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. No good thing. We choose his way and walk uprightly and we embrace his truth. He will withhold no good thing from us. But I've seen people who've decided, I'm going my own way. No one's going to tell me what to do. And, and I don't have to be under authority. I don't even believe authority is right. And one of the sad thing is, is the kind of thing that happened with this brother that taught this issues of authority some years ago. The teaching was right, but when it hit the floor, as they say, the rubber met the road, the men and were taking the teaching and they ran with it and because they weren't taking up the cross themselves and they weren't submitting to authority, they began to exercise authority in an absolutely improper way. Personally, I was extremely thrilled last week to be able to be part of the service and to have 12 men standing here in front of us establishing the authority structure of Calvary Christian Church. One of the things that is so important to realize you know, the difference between Islam, Buddhism, 
Confucianism, Hare Krishna, Mormonism. They were all started by one man. And his opinion was the final authority. That's not the way God established his kingdom. When Jesus established his kingdom, he chose 12 men, gave them authority. The word power is authority over demons and over the kingdom of God. And, you know, it's so wonderful because if one of them would go wrong, you know, you could, it happened. We have, a, we have a case in in the scripture where Peter was making a, signif- a significant major mistake. And Paul, who wasn't even part of the original 12, but became one of the apostles out of due season, he says, Peter, and he rebukes him to his face in front of everybody. You can't go that way, Peter. Paul brought him in the line. One of the reasons why I am so thrilled with what the future of Calvary looks like is we have leadership now, and I have enough confidence in every one of the deacons and elders that if any one of the leaders of the church began to go astray, the, uh, any one of the 12 would have the authority and have the, the wherewithal and the wisdom to say, hold it, that's not right. And I trust all you deacons and elders will take this to heart and do exactly what I'm saying you should be doing. Because when we go down the road, we want to be able to go down the right road. And the right road means there's authority, not a two-bit little crowned king over a little church, but authority is functioning in the church all through the church in God's order and getting God's way. In Psalm 34, he says, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord will not want any good thing. They will not lack any, they will not want for any good thing. He will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly. Let me assure you of something. This should scare you in a good way. The Lord will not insist that you reject death. He will not insist that you choose the right way. You have a free will, and you can choose whatever way you want. But whatever way you choose, you're going to give an account for it. But you're free to do whatever you want. One of the problems with authority that I had to wrestle with as a young man, a young pastor, I was so intent on trying to get people to do what was right. I was trying to force them to do what was right. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, that's not your job. You're to declare the truth and let them choose. He will not insist that you choose life. You can choose life or death. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. What the Lord says is, I've set before you life, and I've set before you death. Now choose. But the life is taking up the cross, denying yourself, coming under authority. The first church I actually was senior pastor of, I was full. It was full of rebels. (laughs) It helped me learn to be able to smell a rebel far off. (laughs) I like to pheasant hunt, and I love to pheasant hunt behind dogs. I don't even like to pheasant hunt unless there's a dog. I was hunting one time with my sons. We were, I think even Stephen was there with Jack down south by Dundee somewhere. And we're walking down this cornfield and I saw a pheasant, and he was about from here to, to uh, Tim Hortons away, but he was as far as past Minerva, 40-some yards to the right. And the dog was out in front of me, and this pheasant was way over there. I mean, a good long way, at least from here to the house across Minerva, maybe the second or third house even. And this pheasant is all crunched down behind his little clump of corn, and I'm watching the dog, and I, I enjoy watching the dogs as much as I do 
shooting at the birds. I kind of like shooting the birds too, but I got 13 of them in my freezer right now. I got to cook up. I used to not like them, but my, just, my son Justin taught me how to cook them, so now I like them and I'm going to cook them. <laughs> And this dog is running around out here, and the wind was blowing an incredible amount of wind. And I thought, now this is going to be interesting to see if that dog can pick up the smell of that pheasant, because it's way over there, the wind is blowing like crazy, and I'm wondering what's going to happen. And that dog's going along, and this dog was like a champion hunter, and he was charging down, and all of a sudden he got even with the wind and even with that bird, and that dog just went like this. And he walked up. And he was a pointer. You know, they put their little leg up. And he got about 10 yards or less from that bird, and he just went. <laughs> I thought, man, I've been around rebels so much, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you are, whether you know it or not. And that first church was just so full of these guys. It's like God trained my nose. And now I've had the advantage of knowing what happened to those people 40 years later. They were, some of them were so spiritual, so meek acting, and so they, they thought they really were godly in the way they acted. Since then, they've been in one church, one church after another church after another church after another church. They can't submit to anybody because nobody is quite as wise as they are. God is setting before you life and death. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh or to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Let me tell you something. The spirit of God will never lead anybody to be rebellious against authority. It'll never happen. Our brother Robert here, our new brother in the church, was in the military, became head rank, E6, I think it was, E6. Tell me, brother, would the military work if there wasn't authority? Not at all. I heard one story where the lieutenant said to the sergeant, go up and check it, what's going on on the top of that hill. The sergeant said, Lieutenant, if I go up to the top of that hill, I'm going to get shot. So what? Go up to the top of the hill. And the sergeant went up to the top of the hill. I don't know if he got shot or not. But when you have war, you know, when I consider what happened on D-Day, on the beaches of Normandy. And these soldiers in the United States Army were jumping out of those landing craft and charging at these hills with machine guns and artillery blazing off the top of the hill at them. And they never stopped. They just kept running until they were either dead or on the hill going up protected. And finally, after thousands of American soldiers were killed, literally often running the machine guns out of bullets. We finally took the hill and established a beachhead in Normandy, France. And from that point on, drove Germany back into Germany and won the Second World War. And the generals, the generals Eisenhower and others that were on the ships were sending those boats out saying, all right, you go there and you go there and you go there and you go there. What would have happened if the captain over that platoon said, Mr. Eisenhower, if we go down there and do what you just told us, we're going to get killed. Not going to do it. Didn't matter. They were gone. Do you, know what the, do you know what the Russians did in World War II when they were attacking the Germans? 
the Russians under Khrushchev and Stalin's command, they put machine guns behind their soldiers. And if the soldiers turned around to retreat for any reason, the Russians shot their own soldiers because they knew they would break the authority structure. Do I believe that we're supposed to lead the way the world does? No. We're to lead by laying down our lives, taking up the cross and denying ourselves. But it's amazing how people expect that from the leaders, but they don't expect it of themselves. Is that true, brothers and sisters? Am I, am I saying something that is accurate? Would you want to submit to me if you sought me just saw me all the time just taking advantage of my position and, and, I, and over the last 40 years, everything I did was always for my benefit? I don't think there would be many of you here today. And if you were, you would be stupid for being here. But it's amazing how we expect leaders to submit to the authority of God's word, but we don't think we have to. Kind of like uh, Korah. <laughs> it's kind of the same spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 13, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field, that which when a man has found it, he hides it, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. That's interesting. That wasn't deceitful. Wow, look at this pot of gold. <laughs> I want to buy your field. <laughs> Why do you want to buy my field? I just like that field. That's, that's a nice field. <laughs> Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had, and he bought it. Are you willing to lay aside your own way to inherit the kingdom? Is it worth it? The command, thou shalt have no other gods before me, includes the God of your own way and my own way. Many Christians camp at the why in the road called authority and never enter into the blessing God has ordained for them and other people that he wanted to bless through them because authority just can't be embraced. Authority is the foundation of the kingdom of God. All through the scripture is called divine order. That's one of the phrases, divine order. It's interesting that when Noah sent out the dove, it would always come back because a dove will not settle where there is confusion. He will only settle where there's peace. So he would send the dove out, and when the dove came back with the olive branch, he knew that it was going, it was going to be safe, and it went back out, and it never returned. And let me say this about your life of prayer and the life of the church. Divine order makes it possible for God's presence to settle on your life. You can't practice God's presence while you de defy his divine order. It's only possible when you find out his way and you follow his truth. One of the sad things about divine order is like we mentioned, I've mentioned these men, they're like the Pharisees. They became centered on the order and they lost the sense of God's presence. They were going to have everything right, but they weren't going to have God's presence. Here was the son of the living God. God in the flesh was there in their faces. And they were so taken up with their divine order that they didn't accept God's presence. Divine order is for the purpose of making God's presence possible. We don't get taken up with a divine order. This morning in churches all over the United States and the world, they have divine order. I was talking to somebody just recently, and they, they said they had been going to a church, and this church was so divinely ordered. And they said they walked in, 
They started dead on time. Song service was dead on at a certain minute. Every detail of the service was controlled. Every detail was under direction. And nothing was to be out of order. And it was all, and every, every part of it was like, choo, 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 choo. and at 12 o'clock, they were done. Holy Spirit just, you know, sorry, sir, but you can't function here. The Holy Spirit's not welcome. Those people have replaced the Holy Spirit with the Holy Word. And they have replaced God's presence with divine order. But you can't have God's presence without the divine order. You can't be living in rebellion and disobedience and self-will and expect God to meet with you. It's just not going to happen. Here's what the Bible says, Isaiah 9. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Isn't that interesting? Of the increase of his government, his authority, and of his peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, and to establish it with justice and with judgment from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The government of God will increase to divine order in your life. But of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end because of the kingdom being ordered. God's divine order. Zechariah says this way, and I want you to turn here, and we're not going to get past this this morning. Zechariah chapter 6, speak unto him, saying, verse 12, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. How many of you know who he's talking about? Who's the man that's the branch? Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, when you read that from the King James or the New King James, it doesn't really clearly say what I think it's communicating. It says it, but you don't catch it as easily. But let me read it to you from a different translation, and it'll make it extremely clear. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall fill fill it with splendor, glory. He shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest on his throne. And a perfect union will reign between the two offices, between them both. It says that he's going to sit on his throne and rule from his throne. He's going to be the king and priest. And the council of peace is between the two offices of priest and king. Do you understand that that's what that's saying? The council of peace will be between the two offices. Between them both. Most Christians are real happy to accept Jesus as their high priest. He is the Savior. The problem is they don't want to accept him as king. But he rules as king and priest on the throne, and that is where peace takes place. The council of peace for your life is when you are submitting to Jesus Christ as both king and priest. The council of peace is between the two offices of king and priest. And Jesus is prophesied to say, he will sit on his throne, he will rule as his throne, he will rule as the king on the throne, and he's going to rule as the priest on the throne, and the council of peace is between those two offices. You don't have peace that passes understanding. It is because you may be saved and you may have accepted the priesthood of Jesus where he brings you into salvation, but you don't have peace because he's not ruling your life. You are. 
I end with this verse in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Although I hope to come to you soon, this is Paul writing, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how you ought to conduct yourselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. How you ought to conduct yourselves. Divine order. We don't like order. We don't like we don't like it when our own government sets out things that we don't like. How many of you like going down I seventy five right now to the ward the north? But if you go down the other side, you're going to fall off into a ditch because they've taken the bridges out. And they're rebuilding the bridges. And so they've diverted all this stuff and they put all these cones up and all these steel barriers and everything. Why? Because they're trying to protect us. They're trying to improve the highway for the future. But I don't know about you, but when I'm driving down that road, it's like, oh, how long is this going to take? I don't like interruption to my driving. How many of you have ever come up to a traffic light? Oh, man. Traffic light stopped you cold. Has anybody ever done that? Okay. Aren't you glad they have traffic lights? Can you imagine? I mean, I've been in, I've been in the Philippines where they drive like crazy. I mean, I was in the car with Pastor Nelson. And we were on an expressway. And it kind of got slow and backed up. You know what he did? He made a U-turn and drove the wrong way on the expressway, went up the entrance ramp, turned around, and went down the service drive. And I said, what are you doing? He says, we do it here all the time. I thought, this is insanity. We took a trip one day, and we went down from the church to downtown about three kilometers it was two hours and people are weaving in and out motorcycles are running between the cars in front of the cars and they're everywhere and I said to him Nelson I could have walked downtown faster than you're driving me downtown there's no order they just do whatever they want almost and it's a disaster I I, I, I was sitting at the light the other day and I said I said thank God we have traffic signals. <laughs> and most people obey them. There's order. Just think what it would be like without it. And the church doesn't think we need divine order. But you know what? You can't have divine order if you don't have someone in authority to establish it. Are you listening to me? And our establishing of authority is based not on our opinion. It's based on the final authority, which is the word of God. And as one lady was mad at me one time, and she said, she was murmuring to another member of our church out in New York. And the lady was a little more upright than her. And she said, well, listen, why don't you go talk to the pastor? And she said this to her without hesitation. I don't want to talk to him. All he'll do is take me to the word of God and show me where I'm wrong. How do you lead people like that? <laughs> how do you pastor them? I mean, I'm a pastor and I have no idea how to do it. Maybe you can give me some suggestions. <laughs> He'll show me for just show me in the word of God I'm wrong. The sad thing is I've shown people the word of God where they're wrong and they still hold to their position. They won't change. In my life Somebody was talking to me the other day and sharing how they appreciated the truths that I've presented over the years. And they asked me the question, how, how did you find these truths? And that's a big answer. That's not just some little answer. But I said, let me give you the one key that I think is probably the most important. And that was when I was confronted with truth. 
I embraced it and changed my mind. Do you do that? Or is your opinion so set, set in concrete from the way you were raised or the way you've been taught that when you're confronted with a conflicting opinion, you don't accept it? If you want truth in this church and you want the future of God's purpose in this church, every single one of us needs to set our heart to embrace the truth, even if it hurts. Even if it hurts. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are the ultimate authority. And you have required of us that we submit to your lordship. And your lordship includes submitting to the authority of your word. It also includes the teaching of your word that we are to submit ourselves to authorities that you have placed in your kingdom. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to give us all the right perspective so that the counsel of peace will settle upon us because we are submitted to you as both priest and king so that your kingdom can come and your will can be done in our individual little pieces of earth and these clay pots and then that we can affect that your kingdom to come in the earth that we live in. Teach us, Lord, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.